Hi, welcome back to session seven of History 3380, World Civilizations. This session is about revolutions. And if we go to the first slide, you'll see it's actually the last slide that I used for the first half. Uh, because I want to briefly go back over what we were talking about in terms of the kinds of changes that were taking place in Europe that led to what we can term revolutions and which in many cases constituted revolutions in and of themselves. And the importance of these changes in bringing on the two revolutions we're going to talk about today, one in England and the other in France, that really served to institutionalize some of the radical reshapings that were already taking place in Europe. So the revolutions themselves in many ways are a product of these earlier changes that I've been talking about. Now, what we're really doing here is looking at the beginnings of modernity, at the world transforming itself from the way it was, the way we've been looking at it in the first part of the course, to what we understand to be the modern world. Now, what that has involved, of course, are a series of events, phenomena, including disease, the pouring of silver from the Western Hemisphere into the European economies, setting off inflation, the development of the sugar industry and its approach to mass production of a consumer good. All of these factors helping to generate uh, the early origins of capitalism as we know it. And this in itself constituted a dramatic shift in the way people interacted with each other. Moving beyond kin group relationships, beyond slavery, now we had wage labor emerging as the way that people interacted in order to develop and change the world. Beyond that, there were other dramatic changes, particularly intellectual changes, uh, the way people were thinking was changing, the way they were looking at the world. If you look at the Renaissance, the in Reformation, the Enlightenment, all of these events are equally revolutionary in their own way. Hmm? And what they led to was a stress on the here and now, the world as it is as we see it. A, an idea of secularism, which meant separating the world between the material world as we understand it and interact with it and the spiritual world. And the idea, for example, with the scientific revolution that we could actually understand and control the physical world using our rational minds. And that we could indeed extend beyond just the world of nature itself and change the political system, the social system that we lived in. All of these changes in the way people were thinking and looking at the world were truly dramatic alterations from the way people had viewed the world in the past, particularly viewing the world largely as a single reality, spiritual and material as one, and the spiritual having direct and immediate impact on the material world. Now, as I mentioned last time, it's easy sometimes for us to go back and say, well, we had this sort of idealistic world of the past, and then modernity came along and messed it all up. Um, but that's not really true. It's not as if there was some kind of ideal existence before these changes took place, particularly by the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries. But it is true that they represented a severe jarring of the way people lived. People's lives were being shaken up. The world as they understood it was changing. The relationships they had with other people were being dramatically altered by these events and these ideas. What that meant was for many people that what had been the security of extended family, of community, that these securities were being disrupted. If we're going to put stress on the individual as opposed to the community, which is certainly something that happens in the modern world. If we're going to talk about wage labor as opposed to getting people to work as a result of their membership in an extended kin group, we call it a tribe or uh, a clan, etc. This means a radical difference from the past. And 
in many ways, it reduces, even eliminates, some of the securities that people had in the pre-modern world. A sort of natural order, if you will. The pace of work for peasants being set by the rising and setting of the sun, as for example. And an understanding that there was a logic to the world that perhaps, indeed, famine might strike, but in the end, somehow this was all part of a divine plan. Well, if you start telling people, well, the, the spiritual and the physical worlds are largely disconnected, then how do we find comfort in the terrible events that can still befall us in this world? These were radical reshapings of people's lives. People who were becoming wage workers in urban areas were living a very different kind of life. Not necessarily worse or better, but radically different from the one that they had understood in the past, where their hours were set essentially by a timepiece, not by the rising and setting of the sun. So there is a growing sense, as we will see as we look over the next few centuries, of a sense of isolation. On the one hand is the promise that, well, now individuals are free to pursue their own interests, to accomplish whatever they can in the world, unencumbered by the superstitions, by the old institutions of the past. But it also leaves people often feeling isolated in the world. Where do they turn for comfort? Where is the connectedness of this new world? And of course, capitalism itself, aside from intellectual changes, caused deep-seated unrest in many societies a new way of producing goods that often threw off the old order. Feudalism, for example, was not exactly the most you know, beneficent form of interaction between people, this patron-client relationship where peasants labored for lords who provided protection. But it had a stability to it that did not exist as capitalism swept through the land. And we will see how these relationships change today as we look at these two specific revolutions. And we can understand from that perspective why people would rebel against these changes because they did so seriously dislocate them from their past. So ultimately, the revolutions may indeed be the price of progress, of radical change. That human beings trying to adjust to new ways of thinking, to new ways of interacting, particularly in the world of economic activity, that these changes were so disruptive, almost inevitably radical reactions were going to take place. <coughs> now, the first of these revolutions is usually referred to simply as the English Civil War, which took place between 1640 and 1648. And Put quite simply, it involved the overthrow of the King of England, Charles I. Now, there are a lot of reasons why this revolution occurred and why it carried out certain dramatic changes in English society. And we're going to look at those larger causes in a moment. But certainly part of the issue was the king himself. Charles was an arrogant human being who deeply believed that he was indeed what is called an absolute sovereign, someone who had been given his right to rule by God himself, and that his rule, he believed, should be totally unchallenged by his subjects, whether they're members of the nobility or the simplest peasant. And he would act in a thoroughly arrogant fashion through much of his life. So certainly to some degree, these events might not have unfolded as they did at this time with a different monarch who perhaps had a more flexible view of reality, perhaps was a little bit more attuned to the changes taking place in the world around him. But on the other hand, we can also say that it's unlikely that these changes would not have taken place at least very soon within English history. 
whether or not Charles had been there or not. Mm. One of the reasons for that had to do with religious issues in England. Hmm. Now, the Reformation had swept through most of Europe during the 1500s, Martin Luther, John Calvin. But England's Reformation was very different from the Reformation in Germany, Switzerland, France, and other places. Because in other areas, <coughs> religious figures, scholars like Luther, had been the leaders of this process of change. But in England, it was the monarch, Henry VIII, who led this process of change. And Henry, quite frankly, had some pr pragmatic reasons why he promoted the Reformation, just as, in some ways, princes who supported Luther and others had practical reasons as well. But here, the dawning of the Reformation is really in the hands of the king himself. He wants to rid himself of his first wife because he's desperate to produce a male heir. The pope, the head of the Catholic Church, will not permit that. And so Henry is determined to join the Church of England to the Reformation, to deny the power of the pope. And that's precisely what he succeeded in doing. But Henry was not a radical reformer hmm. like Luther or Calvin. Hmm. He wanted to get rid of the Pope's control over the Church of England. But other than that, he didn't really want to change the Church a great deal. Hmm. And in fact, the Church of England, or the Anglican Church, looked in physical appearance very much like the Catholic Church looked. Hmm. The only difference was that the head of the Church of England now was the king, hmm. the monarch. Other than that, the Church of England retained the elaborate ceremonies, the hierarchy of bishops that had been in place under Catholicism. This was very much at odds with Reformation thinking. Because for most reformers, it was not simply a matter of the Pope's authority but it had to do with the everyday life of the church and the everyday life of believers. In England, the most committed radical reformers, if you will, uh, were the Puritans. And they believed in very simple services, stripping the churches of all this you know, elaborate tapestries and figures representing the saints, etc. They wanted very simple churches and they wanted a very democratic church order. <coughs> They wanted to largely sweep away the old church hierarchy, that clergymen would really arise from their support in the community. And they believed very sincerely in a personal religious experience. They didn't want their ministers to be intermediaries between them and God. They wanted to speak directly with God. And this was entirely out of touch with the way the Anglican Church actually fun functioned. Because the Anglican Church, again, was basically the Catholic Church with the Pope removed. So we have a conflict that continues to simmer through the end of the 16th and into the beginning of the 17th century. In other words, to the time of Charles I. And Charles, being the authoritarian figure that he was, was insistent on maintaining the supremacy of the Anglican Church that its dominance, its position as the official state religion of England was to go unquestioned. So we have a basic conflict over religion. Although it runs deeper than that because in many ways the reformers are talking about a more democratic order. They may be talking about religion, but they're also talking about democracy. Another problem for Charles was an institution that was very much part of the phenomena of trading empires that we've looked at. And that was, of course, 
the British East India Company. We've seen that as the trading empires developed, they sought to create monopolies to control the trade of, let us say, uh, the Indian Ocean or the Caribbean, to do that at times through monopolistic companies, and the British East India Company was one such company. It was given a monopoly over England's trade with the East Indies, what we'd refer to today as Asia, the Pacific Basin, if you will, the Indian Ocean. So this would lock out many merchants in England. They simply would not have a chance to participate in this very lucrative trade because of the monopoly of this one company that was sanctioned by the state. So there was growing resentment within the merchant community among those who had been excluded towards the monarchy and the insistence of the monarch on maintaining this monopoly. Just as pirates and smugglers may have challenged the trading empires, merchants who were left out of these monopolistic arrangements were also challenging. And as with the Anglican Church, Charles was insistent on having his way. He was going to preserve this monopoly lock, stock, and barrel. So Charles already has developed enemies among religious reformers, the Puritans. There's a growing number of merchants in England that also are at odds with him. A third group that he's having problems with are members of the landowning aristocracy, the elite. This problem arises out of a phenomenon we talked about in the first half of this session and previously. And that was, of course, the price revolution. <clears throat> Silver flooding into Europe, setting off inflation. And what it did was threaten the arrangements of the old feudal order. Many of the feudal obligations of the past had become transformed into fixed rents that people paid. And you simply made a payment to the Lord every month, year, <coughs> as a peasant. That system was fine as long as prices were fairly consistently stable. But as prices rose, of course, the income received by the landowner was decreasing because inflation was eating away at the value of the currency. It was this motivation that helped push some landlords, not all of them by any means, they're a minority who do this, at least initially, began pushing landlords towards enclosure of their land. Their estates typically were populated by hundreds of yeomen or peasants, each of them working a small plot of land and also doing a certain amount of work at the manor house or wherever. But most of what the landowner controlled was this land on which the yeoman worked, producing products, agricultural products, and then sharing a portion of that in some kind of fixed form with the landlord. But this system, steeped in tradition, because many of these people had lived on the estate and their ancestors had lived on the estate for decades, in some cases centuries. And there were strong bonds of loyalty between the two sides. There was obviously a hierarchical system which the landlords controlled the situation, but nevertheless, peasants and lords had certain mutual obligations, and there was a certain degree of noblesse oblige, the sense of obligation on the part of the landlord to take care of the peasants, a uh, sort of paternalistic relationship uh, between the lord and those who lived upon his land. And of course, the landlord encouraged this because at least during the centuries of upheaval after the decline of the Roman Empire, certainly in those centuries, landlords often looked to their peasants to serve as a militia to assist and support them and protect them. So this is a mutually beneficial relationship. And now it's not working because inflation is eating away at the rents received by the landlord. <clears throat> to solve the problem, Landlords enclose the land, as I mentioned before, and throw yeomen off the land, expel the peasants, except for a few, and turn the land over 
to sheep herding. Very profitable business because of the value of wool and making textiles. This is a, one of these radical confrontations, one of these radical dislocations. It's an emergent form of capitalism. And we can well argue that it's the efficient and logical thing to do. But for the peasants living on the land who are now being thrown off, they are furious at this system. They talk of the sheep eating men. In other words, that what's being done to them, they are being destroyed. They are losing their place in society, losing their incomes, because the landlord wants to turn their land over to the raising of sheep. Now, there were mechanisms in place for peasants to challenge these decisions by landlords. They were not totally effective, but there was a basic appeal ultimately to the crown to undo the injustices that might be committed by a landlord. These had been in place for centuries. Because remember, ultimately in the old feudal system, the landlord himself owed his own obligations to the crown, to the king or queen. So the king or queen had a certain control over what happened on the estates. In this case, in England, the primary mechanism was through a court of law known as the Star Chamber. <coughs> the Star Chamber was used primarily to hear complaints against members of the elite. And peasants brought those complaints to the Star Chamber involving enclosure of land. And they would frequently receive a sympathetic hearing in the Star Chamber. Hmm? The king was actually sympathetic to the plight of the peasants. Hmm? But not really because he cared at all about the peasants. Hmm? Charles, as other kings and queens knew, that probably the greatest threat to his rule at any given time were the members of the elite, who besides the crown had any real authority, had command of weapons, etc. Well, members of the elite. So if there's any danger, it's from the nobility, it's from the landowners. So how to keep them in their place? Well, one way is to entertain the complaints, the lawsuits of peasants against the landlords so that they're tied up in court, so they face the potential of jail fines, and other problems. So the crown, Charles, is sympathetic to the peasants, not because he cares a hoot about the peasants or what happens to them, but because he sees them as a convenient mechanism to counter the influence and power of the landowning class. Hmm. The landlords, meanwhile, face a rather difficult time in the courts, hmm. because when they go to the Star Chamber, they're not permitted to know who is making this complaint against them. They are not entitled to face their accusers. Now, this is a right we consider in the contemporary world to be absolutely essential to a fair and just system of trial law, because if you don't know who is making these accusations against you, how can you effectively respond to them? someone charges you with a crime, don't you have the right to say, well, who is this person? I have a right to know who's making this accusation. After all, if I can prove this person has a personal resentment towards me that undermines their testimony, for example, that they are biased towards me. Now, the reason why landlords were not allowed to know who was making the complaint, of course, was to protect the peasants <laughs> because Naturally, if an individual peasant were known to be making a complaint against the landlord, his life expectancy would probably be quite short. <laughs> so this, in essence, was a mechanism that had to be used in order to ensure any kind of justice in the system because of the disparity of power between the lords and the peasants. Nevertheless, 
the landlords deeply resented what was being done to them. So on the one hand, we have the peasants who are extremely unhappy because of the loss of land. On the other hand, members of the nobility are being alienated, at least those who are carrying out forms of enclosure, because they find themselves being dragged into court and facing charges from people who remain nameless. Charles was attempting what other princes and kings and queens were trying to do at this time, and that was to increase his power, to centralize power in the crown itself, and to diminish the power of landlords, members of the aristocracy, etc. You'll see this again in France. One of the challenges that erupts as he tries to do that is from Scotland. We often think of England as a single entity, but England never really has been a single entity. Great Britain has always been a conglomeration of kingdoms. Charles was the king of England, he was also the king of Scotland. And his Scottish subjects were ripe for rebellion, partly because they deeply disagreed with his ideas about the Anglican church. They, didn't, they wanted a local church with local powers, not a state church directed by the crown. When the Scots rebel, Charles finds himself short of resources to suppress that rebellion. And so what he does is what kings of England had done before him, and that is turn to a representative body drawn principally from the nobility and also high members of the church, the parliament. Now, Parliament today, of course, is, well, at least one house, the lower house, the House of Commons, uh, is democratically elected. But Parliament, back in the 17th century, really had no inkling of democracy about it. It was simply a representative institution for the ruling elite in England. And it didn't meet continuously. In fact, it rarely met. The parliament was called into session by the king when he needed something, like money to fight a war, in this case, to suppress the Scottish rebellion. Normally, this involved a certain amount of dickering on the part of the king and the parliament. Uh, he needed money, he needed loans from the nobility, or he needed to raise taxes. And in turn, they wanted certain concessions, more control over the land grants that they had received from the crown, or whatever types of privileges they might be able to squeeze out of the crown. So it was basically a deal-making body. Hmm. King needs money, members of the nobility want to get something in return for the money they're going to have to surrender in the form of loans or taxes. Hmm. But this parliament was a little different. <laughs> this parliament wanted to assert its authority hmm, and claim a right to a major role in the governance of the country in terms of setting policy on taxes and in general in how the country would be governed. Hmm. So here is a monarch who's arrogant in his own right who has set himself on a course which is common with his predecessors, of trying to centralize power, more and more power in the hands of the monarchy. And now, what he finds is a parliament made up of people who are challenging the authority he already has, never mind whatever other authority he might try to gather to himself. So this is a conflict made for civil war. There are fundamental differences between the crown and the members of parliament. There's a kind of hint of that early on uh, when shortly after the parliament opens, it votes uh, to arrest the prime minister, who was selected by the crown, and put him on trial for his life. They basically wanted to execute the prime minister, who was the king's representative in parliament, uh, indicating that they weren't getting along all that well. Uh, 
what happened now was a protracted struggle back and forth until finally, when it was clear that there were basically two separate agendas that would never meet. When that became clear, the opposition members of parliament rose in rebellion and the country slipped into civil war. The end result was the triumph of the parliamentary forces over the crown. Partly this was due to the fact that the <coughs> rebellious forces were able to draw not only on the landowners, but also on many of these discontented merchants and, of course, alienated Puritans. So they were able to form a fairly substantial body of resistance against the king and his policies. Now, Charles was arrested, brought before the parliament. They were preparing him for trial. He was preparing to deliver a speech to them, dismissing the parliament. Because, of course, they had no right to judge him or to try to rule the country. He was an absolute monarch. Um, as soon as they learned what Charles intended to say, they decided to forget about him making a speech to the parliament. And they just went ahead and found him guilty of treason and cut off his head, ending the British monarchy, at least temporarily. So here we have, in the space of less than a decade, because the parliament began in 1640, by 1649 the Civil War is over and Charles has been executed, we have a pretty radical change by anybody's measure. The idea that the King of England would be dragged before the parliament and then executed uh, was virtually unheard of at least in this part of Europe at the time. It's not that other monarchs hadn't been toppled and killed at some time or other. Uh, but here is a truly radical change. And the fact is, he wasn't being replaced, at least not at this time, by another monarch. Instead, the parliament was going to rule the country. So here we have true upheaval in the system. And we can see underneath all of this, all of these currents of change that have set this process off. You have the enclosure movement, that's conflicts between peasants and landlords. You have unhappy merchants because of the existing monopoly in international trade. You have religious reformers who are concerned not only about religion but about basic democratic principles, and about the rights of the individual. All of these currents running through <coughs> British society at this time, portending the arrival of full-blown modernity, but in the process disrupting this society to the point where finally political revolution takes place and the monarchy is destroyed. From 1649 to 1660, England is the Commonwealth of England. In other words, it's no longer a monarchy. And it's during these years that the Parliament essentially carries out dramatic changes to resolve some of the basic issues that had helped bring on the revolution to begin with. One involves the Church of England. The Parliament decides in the end that the Church of England will remain the state church. It is still the official Church of England. Still the official Church of England today. But there is to be tolerance, religious tolerance. The Church of England as the official church is still going to receive tithes or taxes. Still has the right essentially to tax people through the government to support itself, but it no longer has a religious monopoly. Other religions are free to function as long as they do not challenge the monopoly, or I should say, the dominant position of the Anglican Church. As long as they recognize that the Anglican Church is the official Church of England, fine. As long as they're not attacking the Anglican Church, 
They can go on with their religious services and their practices, their beliefs. And again, this is a very modern concept. I mean, if you think about it, particularly in the West, the basic underpinning of sovereignty, the legitimacy of rulers in Europe, down through the centuries, ever since the Roman Empire, the late Roman Empire, had been confirmed by the fact that the church, the Catholic church, had affirmed their position as divine right rulers, that God had chosen them. And in turn, to maintain that position and that legitimacy, Western kings felt compelled to ensure religious uniformity. Now that's over. There isn't going to be religious uniformity. Yeah, everybody's a Christian of one kind or another, or 90 percent of them are, but there is no longer a single Christian religion that totally monopolizes the system, the society, nor will the government try to enforce that kind of uniform religious monopoly. Another change comes in the abolition of the Star Chamber. This actually happened during the Long Parliament, but was confirmed by later law. In other words, they're getting rid of the system by which the power of landlords could be challenged by the government. Now, of course, in later times, historians would write about how this was a great triumph for individual rights, that no longer would someone have to face a trial in which they could not know the name of their accuser, where they could not question their accuser. And there's no question that in later centuries it took on that significance. But at the time, the real issue was, look, at this is a reaffirmation of the power of the landlords. They're no longer going to be threatened with lawsuits from the peasantry because the peasants will no longer have the security of the star chamber in which to make their accusations and see the legal system go against the landlords. In itself, but other legislation as well, affirms the right of private property. Hmm. And what that means is that people are now seen as owning property without being restrained in how they use their property and without risking the loss of that property to the state. In the past, the assumption was that landlords ultimately derived the right that they had to control their land from the crown. And indeed, in England, that was true in many ways, because during the Reformation, Henry had taken land from the, Protestant, from the Catholic Church and given it to landlords. But the general assumption was that all land belonging to members of the elite really came from the crown in the end, and the crown would have ultimately the right to take it back if it wanted to. That principle is now abolished. Now private property reigns supreme. It's not that, yes, in some extreme circumstances, even today, of course, there's eminent domain and the state can take land under certain specific conditions. But other than those extreme circumstances, private property owners are free to do whatever they want with their land. Hmm. This was an important development for the continuing evolution of capitalism because if you're not free to use your land as you choose, your property, then how can you enter into a capitalist venture? How, why would you want to throw the peasants off the land and invest in sheep if the state could come along in a couple of years and say, oh, well, that's a mistake. Sorry, you're out of here. We're taking the land back. So this means that people now can have a security when they engage in capitalist enterprises that the land will be theirs now and in the future. Hmm. One other thing was a liberalization of trade to a degree. The East India Company still maintained much of its monopoly control in Asia, in the Indian Ocean. But trade with the Americas was liberalized, in other words, with the Western Hemisphere, 
merchants gained, more merchants gained access to trade with what were the emerging colonies, the British colonies in Canada and in what became the United States and North America in general, and of course the uh, British colonies that would be created in Central, uh, in the Caribbean as well. In fact, it's during the Long Parliament that the British actually seized control of, or rather in the years after that, from 1649 during the Commonwealth period, that the British actually seized Jamaica, the island of Jamaica, and start establishing themselves in the Caribbean. All of these areas were going to be open to trade by a wide variety of merchants. So again, we're opening up the system to a more free trade. It's not exactly a fully free trade, but still, it's a more competitive economic system for merchants now than it existed in the time of Charles I. So all of these dramatic changes take place in England as a result of the revolution and the actions of Parliament. Now, this is sort of what's happening at the top and the struggles between the landowners and the merchants and the crown. But there were other people who had a more radical take on what this revolution was about. One group were known as the levelers. The leading figure among the levelers was a man named John Lilburn. And he, not surprisingly, was a Puritan agitator. Not surprising because this is what the Puritans were about. They were about democratic procedure. They didn't want a church hierarchy. They wanted congregations to be set up, you know, for people to form congregations, religious, you know, communities of like-minded believers. And they would choose who their minister would be, who would be their religious leader. Well, it doesn't take much to move from that kind of idea to the idea that, well, people in general should have that same right in the political environment, not just with their church. And Lilburn was one of the people that can carry that idea from the religious sphere into the political sphere, calling for free speech, calling for an expanded suffrage. Hardly anyone in England can vote at this time. You know, it's basically the elite. So these are radical revolutionary ideas. Another group, even more radical, were the diggers. They represented, in many ways, the interests of the yeomen and the peasants. These were people who wanted to reverse the process of enclosure, and more than that, create a free peasantry. So the peasants wouldn't have to work on the land of landlords anymore, that they would have their own land. And they wanted to create communal land holdings. Okay, we have an estate here with a landlord and peasants working for the landlord. Well, what the diggers want to do, they want to say, well, look, it, let's get rid of the landlord and then leave the peasants to work together to work the land for their own benefit. They don't need the landlord. Needless to say, these ideas weren't warmly welcomed by Parliament. These were ideas that severely threatened all of the groups that had been fighting against Charles, mm -hmm. the landlords, the merchants, because they threatened the new idea about private property, about capitalist enterprise, and they threatened the very elitist political structure that existed, where only wealthy merchants and landlords had any voice in the political system. But the ideas of the diggers and the levelers were harbingers of what was to come. Hmm. Both in neighboring France, a little more than a century later, and in the 20th century. If we look across the span of time from the English Civil War hmm, through the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution. We see a series of radical movements espousing many of these same ideas about social and economic equality, about political democracy, about the freedom of and rights of the individual. Many of these ideas found their origins in the ideas of the levelers and the diggers of the 17th century. 
Now, overseeing the suppression of these groups was Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell had become essentially the chief executive of Commonwealth England. His official title for at least the later years of his rule was the Lord Protector. Uh, the logic here was that, look, it, you can't have a parliament that has executive power. You can't rule a country through a legislature. You need an executive branch to be making day-to-day -day decisions. Legislatures are fine for passing laws and that sort of thing, but they're not very good at making day-to-day -day decisions. So Cromwell had taken on that role. But eventually, soon after Cromwell's death, there's a brief period where his son ruled, uh, the elite turned back to monarchy as their preferred form of government. With the restoration of the monarchy, Charles II being brought to England and installed in his father's place in 1660. But this was a very different monarchy than it had existed just 30 years before. This is a monarchy which now, more than anything, is a figurehead monarchy. And very rapidly, from here on in, the parliament and the prime minister, the chief executive of the parliament, will take more and more control of the government. The monarchy was useful for establishing a known political system. It looked nice and safe. People recognize, okay, things are back to normal. We've stopped dealing with these radical ideas of levelers and those sorts of things. And everyone will recognize the traditional form of government. But it was a hollowed out traditional form of government. In other words, yeah, you still got a king, but the real power is in the parliament. The radical change was there. It was just covered over by installing a monarchy once again. A little bit like in the Industrial Revolution when people began building industrial plants, they'd put all these kinds of ornate features on their industrial plants and they'd look like you know, churches from the 17th century. But inside was a modern industry. It helped people adjust to the idea of what a modern factory was. Well, that's what they were doing in England in the 17th century. How do we adjust to these radical changes? Well, look, things aren't that radically different. We still have a king, or we have a king back, so calm down. But underneath the surface, the reality is the parliament runs things. Now, across the English Channel in France, another revolution was brewing, even as early as the 1660s, but it would take another 100 years for it to erupt. One of the basic causes was similar to England's in that a monarchy was trying to consolidate power. The most famous figure in this process was Louis XIV, the Sun King. But his descendant, Louis XVI, was continuing that process, if somewhat less efficiently. And the basic idea, again, was to make the monarchy, the state itself, all-powerful, and to reduce the power of the nobility, those people with whom the monarchy had had to share power during the old feudal era. The state is trying to institute tax reforms, which would mean, in essence, taxing the nobility, something they're not very used to to rationalize the tax system, to build an efficient modern military that will not be dependent upon the nobility. But in the process, the crown, of course, comes into deep conflict with the nobility, who knows what is being done. They realize that their positions will be undermined by what the crown is trying to do. The other problem for the crown is that, given its very creaky fiscal system, which has still not been effectively reformed, tax reform has still been blocked by the nobility, uh, leaves the crown in deep debt, particularly once the French crown decides to pour a small fortune into the American Revolution. Why? Because the British were their rivals. They saw this as a great way of undermining British power 
by assisting the rebels in the North American colonies. But it further drives France into debt. To solve that problem, again the need for money just like Charles I in England, Louis calls together the Estates General. What is the Estates General? Call it the Parliament if you want. It consists of three estates. Members of the nobility, members of the church hierarchy, and commoners. Now, this sounds like a fairly democratic system. You've got representatives from each of three major groups. Uh, the only thing was that each group in the Estates General only got one vote. So the nobility has one vote, the church hierarchy has one vote, and everyone else, the commoners, have one vote. Now this isn't terribly democratic because, of course, if you take the nobility and the members of the church hierarchy together, they constitute less than 2% of the population. The other 98% of the population gets one vote. <laughs> and of course, in the past, when estates general were called, for the same reason they called parliaments in England, uh, the same idea of negotiating taxes and so forth, when this would happen, the crown could pretty well count on the church hierarchy and the nobility always voting with it against the commoners. So the commoners had very, real, very little power. The third estate representing everybody had no power. But in this case, in 1789, there was deep discontent riling the country. Peasants were up in arms, and we'll see why. Members of the artisan class, skilled workers, they were furious. There was violence taking place in the countryside. And in this revolutionary environment, the third estate struck out for power. They demanded a reformulation to get rid of the Estates General and create a National Assembly. In the face of the upheaval, members of the elite were willing to go along with it in hopes that they could calm the country. In effect, what happened was the Estates General turned itself into a National Assembly. And in doing so, they agreed to double the number of members from the Third Estate. So what you get now is one person, one vote in a National Assembly. Now the commoners have some serious power. Now the Crown, of course, has been watching all this <laughs> and dreading every moment of it. Louis sees his power rapidly slipping away. And so he calls in his professional army, groups of German mercenaries who have been hired to serve as the military forces of France. He wants them to surround the National Assembly and essentially suppress it. Just as he's about to do that, a rebellion breaks out in Paris. The common people of Paris rise up in rebellion against the crown and what is known as Bastille Day, because they attacked a royal prison known as the Bastille. That event frightens Louis, because now he realizes he's not just dealing with a few hundred members of a national assembly. Now he's dealing with outright rebellion in his own capital. So he backs off. Now, these events, with the calling of the Estates General, the attempt to suppress the National Assembly. All of this was happening, of course, because there was upheaval in the country. Hmm. Part of it, of course, was the conflict between the nobility and the crown over the crown's attempt to gather more and more power in its own hands. Hmm. But the single most powerful force shaping events at this time were the peasants in the countryside. Now, I've mentioned this before, the fact that in France what happened was not enclosure, 
It's not that landlords went out and enclosed land and threw peasants off it. Instead, what was happening is that the landlords were finding that they could reinstitute old feudal obligations. Like, we have a right to a certain amount of the wine you produce. We, you have to go out and gather firewood for me twice a week and whatever else was on the books. Feudal obligations that had allowed, largely been allowed to lie fallow for years, decades, uh, and had largely been replaced by simply the payment of a fixed rent. Well, wasn't working in England, wasn't working in France. Hmm. But the solution in France was to reinstitute the old obligations and begin squeezing the peasants. This was accelerated by the fact that many people who now owned land in France were members of the merchant class who had been looking for other forms of lucrative investment and secure investment. So they had bought land. And they were efficient businessmen. They were going to make money out of the land. And that was by squeezing the peasants. As the National Assembly is meeting, hmm? fear spreads through the French countryside. At first, the calling of the Estates General and then its conversion into a National Assembly was met with great hope in the countryside. Peasants thought, well, soon the National Assembly will act and we'll be relieved of these feudal dues, we'll be liberated. But then rumors began to spread that, in fact, what the king was going to do was send out forces to kill peasants, hmm. to destroy them, hmm. to protect the old system. Hmm. There were war talk of foreign conspiracies. The king was bringing in foreign armies. Hmm. In response to those rumors, peasants began rising up and attacking the landlords, literally, hmm. executing many of them burning down their manor houses, seizing the land. What was known as the Great Fear swept through France. The legitimacy of the rumors, entirely unfounded. But in this environment of upheaval, of suffering by the peasants, it was not surprising that so many people believed and acted upon those rumors. Effectively, the peasants were bringing an end to feudalism. The National Assembly would later, of course, abolish it officially, but they were just confirming what the peasants were already doing in the countryside, wiping away the old feudal order. What they were creating is a sort of petty capitalist economy. They were going to be the landowners now. They were going to produce crops for the market. The old feudal order would die, and a new small capitalist system would emerge in the countryside. The National Assembly would further accelerate that process, particularly for the wealthy, by seizing all of the lands controlled by the Catholic Church and selling those lands off to the well-to-do. So we have a radical transformation here. The feudal order in France is essentially being abolished. both by the actions of the peasantry and the actions of the National Assembly, which in many cases are confirming what people in the countryside are already doing. Beyond that, the National Assembly also issued a declaration offering a new perspective on French society, the Declaration of the Rights of Man which can be taken generically to mean the Declaration of the Rights of Human Beings. Hmm. Essentially, it was establishing the rights of the individual hmm, in French society. Hmm. It was a declaration that each individual had the right to pursue his or her interests hmm, unencumbered by the old hierarchy. Hmm. And what did that mean? Hmm. What it meant was that French society under the old feudal order had been a society of privilege. How did people get to be landlords? Hmm. How did they get to be members of the church hmm. hierarchy? Hmm. 
They were born into it. You were born into your social class. Hmm. And those privileges of the nobility were inherited from generation to generation. The Declaration of the Rights of Man is essentially saying that's all over. We're abolishing that. We're creating a world of equal opportunity where each individual will have the opportunity to fulfill his or her destiny and where the state will treat everyone as an equal. You're no longer a subject of the king or a subject of the queen. You are a citizen of the Republic of France. A radical new way of looking at people in society and in the political environment. Now, Louis, of course, <laughs> wasn't exactly in agreement with all of this. Uh, he wanted desperately to reverse the course of events. And he did begin conspiring to escape from France and to join with other European powers that wanted to roll back the revolution. Needless to say, there are people, monarchs, in Austria, Prussia, basically, modern-day Germany, and elsewhere that are looking horrified at what's going on in France. I mean, this is worse than anything the English had done in the 17th century. They're creating a republic. They're talking about people being citizens. They're abolishing the nobility. So Louis had ready allies on the borders of France. And he attempted to escape from Paris and to join those forces to provide legitimacy for their invasion of France. He was captured, however, and executed in January of 1793. Now, aside from the fact that, of course, the execution of Louis just, again, sent shivers through the royal courts of Europe. Yeah, they're killing a king. Uh, his execution also pointed up something else about the culture of the revolution. Its strong emphasis, again, on rationalism. Now, these ideas about being equal citizens and so forth, these are all based on Enlightenment thought about rational analysis of the social order and the political order and what should be as opposed to what is. Hmm. Many of the ideas of Enlightenment thinkers are finding fulfillment in the French Revolution. Hmm. Here, you know, it isn't logical, it doesn't make sense to have monarchies and to have these inequalities. The rational, logical thing is that everyone should be equal under the law. Hmm. And that rationalism even extended to the process of execution. When Louis is executed, he's executed with a guillotine. Hmm. And of course, it's one of these structures, the wooden frame running up and a huge metal blade hung between the two arms that extend into the air. Put your head on the block, they let the blade go, go slices your head off. It was a rationalized form of execution. Up until this time, when they killed and executed people like Charles I, etc., you had to go before an axeman who would hopefully cut your head off. Uh, hopefully in the sense that he would do it quickly and efficiently, which often didn't happen. I mean, most axemen didn't have that good an aim or that good a knowledge of the human anatomy. Uh, and if they hit you right on one of the discs of your, you know, one of your vertebrae, uh, the axe is just as likely to bounce off uh, and not kill you. <laughs> Leave a big hole, uh, but you wouldn't be dead. And sometimes it'd have to chop away. If you've ever cut up a chicken, you know, and you fail to hit, and get it right at the joint there. You know, you're sawing away and, you know, trying to get the damn thing cut. Well, that's what often happened in executions when they were using an axe. And Dr. Guillotine, uh, the French physician, had designed the system as a humane form of execution, assuming that executions can be humane, that you would no longer suffer the cruelty of an axeman, because here you would have the efficiency of a modern 
machine of death. <laughs> so even in the area of execution, we see this rationalist impulse that we can do it better, more efficiently, more effectively, whether it's the form of government, the social order, or even how we kill people. Of course, the guillotine wasn't going to be of much help to the French revolutionaries as Prussia, Austria, Hungary, and other countries invaded France trying to destroy its revolution. At this time, by the 1790s, France is being ruled by a new body, the National Convention, uh, the name given to it because it was supposed to be a convention to develop a constitution for France, this new republic. Uh, but again, it was basically came to serve as a legislature. The problem was, how do you fight a war with a legislature? It's very difficult for them to make the day-to-day -day decisions needed to win a war. So as a result, one of the committees in the convention, the Committee of Public Safety, a 12-member committee within the convention was given the power, essentially, to run the war and to run the country. It became the de facto executive branch of the French government at this time in 1793. Among the leading figures of the Committee of Public Safety was a member of one of the more radical political parties, the Jacobins, a man named Robespierre. Hmm a lawyer, a man, an educated man, typical of the educated commoners, the merchants, and uh, professionals who had helped lead the revolution. Robespierre had a dream of a democracy of small producers, that what France would become, and here we can see here echoes of the levelers and the diggers, A democracy of small producers, artisans, the sans culottes, the poorer people of the urban areas, the workers and peasants, who would have small pieces of property, small shops, and produce the economic wealth of the country. We'll get rid of not only the nobility, but any large landowners. And we will have an egalitarian society made up of artisans with their crafts, peasants with their small pieces of land. And this, of course, was an appealing prospect to many people, particularly as peasants had faced the threat of increasing encroachment by landowners who had been squeezing them, as artisans saw modern capitalist activity starting to undermine their guild system this idea of a democracy of small producers had great appeal. And Robespierre intended to create that, even in the midst of fighting a war. To meet the threat of the war, the Committee of Public Safety launched what became the first example of total warfare, of a country devoting its entire resources, human, economic, to winning a war. This was not going to be a war fought on the French side by a bunch of mercenaries. The levy en masse was declared. In other words, a national draft. People would be drafted into the military to control inflation because, of course, there was this huge demand for goods to fight the war and that had caused prices to rise. The maximum was established, which was a set of price controls. Keep people from being gouged during this period of high demand for goods. To maintain order, the terror. Informal courts were set up to put people on trial. And there were rapid executions when those courts reached decisions. And of course, they were carried out by the efficiency of the guillotine. Now, it's a common folklore that the people who were mostly executed during the terror were members of the nobility. If you ever read, you know, A Tale of Two Cities, that kind of story. Absolutely untrue. This is 1793. This is four years after the 
National Assembly had been created. Most of the nobility have long left town. <laughs> They're not hanging around. Most of the people who were executed during the terror were merchants and well-to-do peasants who were convicted of overcharging for their goods. Hmm. This is a serious, they took price controls very seriously. This was an attempt to maintain equality in society by using the powers of the state. On the one hand, Robespierre had this dream of an egalitarian society, this democracy of small producers, merchants, artisans, I mean artisans, peasants. In fighting the war, he tried to push for that kind of equality. Everyone can be drafted. Prices will be the same for everyone. There will be no gouging, no profiteering. But to achieve that, he also used the power of the state to execute thousands of citizens. These two realities are going to reappear time and again in the next several centuries in the modern world with revolutionary movements attempting to create egalitarian societies and in the process turning towards totalitarian political systems in order to achieve that equality. The first hints of it are here in the French Revolution. But Robespierre's ruthless elimination of his enemies, including his political enemies in the convention, finally led to a reaction among many political figures who just didn't know whether the, the ax was going to fall or the guillotine was going to fall on them next. And Robespierre was overthrown in what's known as the Thermidorian reaction. The revolutionary forces had renamed the months of the year. Thermidor was one of those months. We call it July. <laughs> so in July of 1794, Robespierre was overthrown and taken off to be executed, of course, using a guillotine. So we see the French Revolution as an expression of these radical changes that had been sweeping through the countryside and through the state. As the state tries to centralize power, comes into conflict with the nobility, as peasants see their lives being burdened by more and more of these feudal dues being reinforced upon them by landowners seeking profits. The underpinning of French society is shaken and finally we see this eruption in revolutionary force. And out of the revolution come both the promise of an egalitarian ideal, the equality of human beings, but also the danger that modern state systems can be used against their own people. The dream of equality, the threat of totalitarianism. In the age of revolutions, encompassing both changes of the intellectual kind, the Enlightenment, the Reformation, and changes in the economic order and changes in the political order, such as the two revolutions we've just seen. A series of new ideas and institutions are emerging. Perhaps most powerfully, capitalism. The whole idea of wage labor, of efficient use of materials to create more and more wealth and the basic idea of the interaction of human beings through a wage labor system, setting aside the old practices of feudalism, of kin group relationships that had dominated most of the world for several thousand years. An emphasis on rationality, on the use of the rational mind. The French Revolution is a classic expression of this. We can create a rational social and political order, one which is egalitarian and democratic, far superior to the old order by using our own rational analysis. Secularism will separate the spiritual from the material. Even in England, 
Okay, the church is not, we're not going to have one monopolistic church anymore. We're going to rely more on rational thought to deal with the world around us. When we want to design a political system, an economic system, we're not going to look to religious inspiration. We're going to look to our own rational ideas. We're separating the spiritual and the material. Individualism, the rights of the individual, whether it is the Puritans in England, the revolutionaries in France, a new focus on the rights and opportunities of the individual. And finally, popular sovereignty, aspired to by the levelers and the diggers, actually created, in a very real sense, in the French Revolution, that the people will rule, the people will be sovereign. Hmm. All of these radical changes hmm, encompass some of the fundamental realities of what becomes the modern world. The birth of the modern world is here in these events in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. Hmm.